Good evening, everyone. My name is Steve Sincula, and I am the CEO of AgriSecure. I want to thank everyone for joining us this evening. It's great to have uh, such a, a good group out in the evening to talk about organic weed management. Just a few housekeeping notes before we get started. Uh, throughout the conversation, we do want to encourage questions. Uh, there's a few ways that you can make that happen. Uh, there's a chat function where you can enter in questions. There's also a Q&A function where you can enter in questions. Feel free to enter those in. If it's a question we think we're going to get to a little bit later or we want to handle at a different point, I might hold off on it. Otherwise, I'll stop. Uh, we'll take some breaks throughout the presentation to answer questions. If there's something that you want to say, I've muted everyone or everybody's coming in on mute. Uh, if you raise your hand, uh, by clicking the raise your hand button. Uh, if you want to say something, I'll watch for that and I'll, I can unmute you at that point. Uh, with that, we'll hop into it. I also want to note that this is being recorded uh, this evening, so uh, just for everybody to be aware of that. So this evening, the topic is organic weed management practices and tools to help you bring profitable results uh, to organic farming. This evening, you'll be hearing from myself. Again, I'm Steve Sincula, the CEO of AgriSecure and a co-founder. You'll also be hearing from Bryce Earlbeck, a co-founder uh, and owner of B&B Earlbeck Farms, as well as Ken Jenkins, an account executive with AgriSecure and owner and operator of Goliath Ag. I'll have them introduce themselves uh, when, when they first in, uh, cover some of the topics. So weed management. Is it, is it a barrier or an opportunity? For those of you who are considering organics, uh, it is one of the biggest concerns that we consistently hear from both our members and those who are looking at organics. From those of you who are already organic, you know it's a challenge and you're constantly looking for new opportunities to help improve your weed management practices. At AgriSecure, we believe that weed control is possible but you need to have the right plan, tools, and support to make the best efforts you can to help keep the weeds at bay. Fortunately, many of the practices related to weed management are also synergistic with soil health. And so as you work on that long-term plan, it not only helps you manage weeds, but also helps continue to improve your soil health. In terms of whether it's an opportunity for organics, the concerns over weeds has limited adop adoption of organics. So it really does create an opportunity for those who are inorganic by limiting supply, number of acres in inorganic in production, and providing the premiums that organic farmers have benefited from over the last several decades. And so at AgriSecure, we look at it both as a barrier or something that we need to really consider carefully, but also as part of the opportunity that's involved with organics and those that can be leading edge or top notch at managing weeds are going to have a real advantage uh, in being able to capture the other benefits of organic production on their farms. This evening, from an agenda perspective, we're going to start by talking through five principles that we've adopted at AgriSecure to help with successful weed management. We'll then talk about weed control tools. So what are the implements and the tools that you can help in your operation to get it done and when and where do they fit? Uh, we'll then jump into organic no-till. And this is just a topic we're gonna touch upon lightly. It's one where we receive some questions from registrants about no-till organics. And then we'll wrap up with innovative egg technology solutions that are either here today or, or might be on the horizon and things to watch out for the future. Again, you know, we want to continue to emphasize that what underpins our discussion tonight is having the right plans, tools, and support for weed management, and so we'll be coming back to that theme throughout. Uh, again, for those of you who have joined since uh, we kicked off, please use the chat function or the Q&A function to ask questions throughout. We'll try to take breaks and answer your questions if they're ones that we don't think we're going to address directly in the topic or the content we've pulled together today. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Bryce Earlbeck to uh, kick off the discussion. Good evening, everyone. Bryce Earlbeck talking, a co-founder farm in West Central Iowa. We converted our farm organic about five years ago, uh, went through all the growing pains that uh, everybody else has gone through, and uh, learned quite a bit, and then travel all over the country working with organic farmers in different scenarios. So uh, kick it off tonight with weed management 
management principles. And I don't want to disappoint everybody. Uh, if everybody's coming to look for that silver bullet to take our weeds, I'm afraid we don't have it. Uh, it, it, it just doesn't exist that we know of. Uh, it takes it takes uh, it takes principles and understanding and knowledge and uh, just plain hard work. But putting all those together, it is possible. And so we've had questions come in before the webinar pertaining to certain weeds, how to control them best. Uh, it, we're not gonna, going to cover every one of those scenarios. We're going to cover the outlying principles that uh, uh, that we that we see could work for almost every farming situation if, if each of them are, are done correctly. Uh, it's starting with that planning and management. So having a long long term rotation plan that breaks up uh, weed cycles using a uh, using agronomic knowledge and a corn soybean small grain every five years is, is something I've seen that is not highly successful highly successful. Uh, long term to to make the organic rotation work. Uh, longer rotations, different crops, different uh, breaking up those different weed cycles is a principle that uh, I, I've seen organic farms to be effective with both large and small. Uh, it takes long term planning, uh, not just for rotation, but inputs, operations, insurance, harvesting, marketing, financial planning, uh, and those those go back to having those on time every time every year when they need to occur. It sounds simple, but if you're five days late with a, a, a cereal rye for a no-till cover crop operation, that can make the world of difference. Um, so thinking about all that, have to, the planning is very important. The management is very important. Uh, and the last thing we talk about is timing. Timing is, is everything in the world. So the, the second uh, principle that we look at is crop rotation and cover crops. Uh, utilize a the cover crops and the and the cash crop uh, for a purpose. Uh, one thing that we do on our farm is we grow three years of alfalfa before our corn crop. We're using that alfalfa for weed control, nitrogen management, and we sell it as a cash crop, but we're growing that for a purpose. Uh, some things that we look at mustard before soybeans are utilizing that cover crop to manage the, the free flowing nitrogen early in the spring, such as oats before corn. We're taking that top two inches of nitrogen, we're putting it in the oats crop, or tilling it under and having it slowly break down over the summer, rather than uh, allowing that free nitrogen floating in the top two inches to stimulate weed growth. And so having all that, that understanding of why you're doing something, not just throwing a cover crop out there to say soil health and I have a cover crop and it looks nice and green in the summer, but understanding why you're using it and using it for an effective reason uh, is things that, that we want people to understand and understand the science behind it so they know why they're doing it. The third principle is soil health. We hear a lot of people talk about soil health, my, myself included. Uh, before it became organic, it, it was just uh, three words and it didn't have much meaning other than use cover crops, try to do the right things. Uh, but having a, a well oxygen, oxygenated soil, adequate calcium and sulfur, uh, higher organic matter with a diverse ro rotation uh, brings soil health. And you can tell the difference between a healthy soil and organic with those, those couple of principles of, uh, I'll go over them again, but oxygenated, oxygenated soil, adequate in calcium and sulfur. Uh, and then you can go down to the micronutrients and biodiversity and all that. But uh, starting with the basics of soil health will make a huge difference. Uh, then using, using a tillage toolbox, uh, it's not always going to be the same every year. Being flexible, having the tools to be able to manage the amount of acres that you're doing uh, know why and when you're going to use the tools and have backup planning and management to go along with that. And then let our ROI be your guide. Uh, one of the biggest mistakes that I see across the country from uh, Colorado, New Mexico, Arkansas, over to Ohio is uh, buying bigger, greener, redder, newer uh, equipment to solve problems. Usually that problem will exist in the field and something is causing that problem. If you're talking about foxtail or thistle, or, or, or anything like that. Uh, usually equipment doesn't solve the problems. We gotta go back and address either the soil, the crop rotations, the fertility. Uh, and, and it's a lot cheaper usually to do that to, than to buy this, all the equipment that uh, I've seen people buy. With that, uh, I'll turn it back over to Ken for the next few slides to go over each of these in detail.
Ken, are you on? All right, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, there we go. All right, sorry. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Um, as mentioned, my name is Ken Jenkins and I'm a certified crop advisor and account executive at here. I graduated from Iowa State University with an agronomy degree and uh, also farm 400 acres, uh, organic and some in transition yet in North Central Iowa. Uh, since Bryce kind of went through that list already, I'm just going to touch uh, a little bit deeper on each of those topics. So we'll start off with this first one, the planning and execution. Uh, planning and execution seems like it's the easiest step, but it's often the most underappreciated and overlooked step. So building and executing a proactive plan to work the field before planting through canopy to make sure weeds cannot take hold is critical. Um, staying ahead of the game often means only minimal soil disturbance is required, which is one of the agri goals. And doing so requires closely monitoring the weather so you can accomplish the needed tillage prior to canopy. And so one of the, the most successful weed free uh, fields I've ever seen is by Amy Brock, who works with us as well. And she's got this idea where if she sees a rain cloud, she's basically running into her equipment to see what she can make a tillage pass before the rain puts her out for a few days. So being proactive uh, really can help if you don't know how many days you're going to be out of the field. Uh, the simplest, biggest mistakes you can make with weed control and organic system is to fall behind. Uh, once you get behind, it's really hard to catch up. Having a detailed field plan in place, including the time and flexibility, to be in the field every three to five days for a tillage pass is not only wise, but it's also necessary. So next, if we take a look at our capacity to execute and what that means. So planning across all your fields is essential for end season success. It's not just the, uh, the organic fields. If you have a split operation, you have, to, you have to think about how those conventional acres are gonna impact your operation as far as timing of different activities. So you can see we have something from our my farm platform and what it essentially is showing you is that there's 390 acres um, but if you look at that may time frame there's 2700 plus acres that we have to cross um, and so now we need to be asking ourselves the questions of do i have the right size equipment do i need to go from a six to an eight or to a 12 or a 16 row um, do, I, do we need bigger fuel barrels or another one in order to keep progress moving at that point and not waiting for fuel to come? Uh, do we need another tractor or should we custom hire out some of that work? Uh, one of the things that we've done on our farm to pick up some efficiency is that we hired out our soybean planting this last year. And the reason we did that is it allowed for, as our organic corn was emerging, it allowed us to get timely uh, tillage passes in there and make sure that we're getting as many in as possible to catch the the weeds at the white root hair stage. Um, so then the key is to plan, to be ready and for the unexpected to happen. Uh, knowing a potential problem and having a backup plan before the occasion arises, you'll be prepared and hopefully not set back. So now uh, Ken, can I number add, two. Yeah, jump in. Can I add something in there, Ken? So one of the things about planning, and I recognized early on in farming, a lot of planning goes on in the producer's head. Uh, from the start of the spring to the fall, uh, farmers keep a lot in their head. And a lot of mistakes and, and trials and tribulations get chalk, chalked up to, oh, it's just this year. Oh, it's just this weather or, oh, that rain cloud just came in. Uh, we didn't make it to that field. Understanding before what the plan is, understanding at the end of the, the, the year why, why it went right or wrong, and having data and information. Uh, just to, to understand how far we're going into data information for planning, in, in Carroll County, Iowa, I have about 11 to 12 days from that May 5th to that June 5th uh, of working field days in an average year. In a, a very good year, I'll get 15 to 20. Uh, in a very poor year, I'll get five days. Uh, how do we build data information plans around that, understand what went right or wrong with our planning and execution? Uh, and we do that by keeping track of everything. 
instead of the old farmer mentality of having it all in their head, we have something that we can go back to, something that we can understand and that uh, we have documented. So just want to add that in, Ken. Yeah, thank you, Bryce. And that's very valid. So if we want to go to the, the second principle now, we'll discuss the crop rotation and cover crops and how those uh, impact weed control. So long-term crop rotation should focus on the following, uh, minimizing the weed seed bank, building soil health, and mitigating the opportunity for weeds to persist. Uh, typical corn soybean rotations can prove challenging as both crops have similar planting and harvesting cycles, which does not disrupt the weed cycle. Incorporating small grains is an option to consider as planting early. will keep the ground covered, um, but the harvest occurs before the weeds go to seed. And an early seed and cover crop can then be used, such as cereal rye or some, um, now I'm drawing a blank on it. Thank you. <laughs> Ultimately, uh, the crop rotations with different harvest periods and cover crops helps disrupt the normal weed cycle. And an additional benefit with, with small grains is they allow the field work to be spread out a different planting and maturity timeframes. This effectively expands that operational capacity that we just talked about in the previous slide. Bryce, did you wanna add anything in this before we move on to cover crops? Yeah, and I'll just add in from my farming experience, which uh, as young as I am, is one of the things is we've actually downsized the equipment from our conventional farm to our organic farm. Uh, as we're, we're running the combine from uh, the end of June till end of October, November. Uh, so the, the rotations benefit in, a, in many different ways, not just the, the, the weed seed bank and building soil health. Uh, mitigating all that or minimizing the work at a, a single time and point in the operational season. Um, building, building that operational efficiency into it, creating better weed control um, and, and having those different crops in there through the rotation uh, cuts out those different weed cycles. So okay, we can go to the, the next one. I just wanted to add that in there. Thank you. So getting a good start on weed control begins with the fall before. Um, in an organic system, this means leveraging cover crops to minimize opportunities for weed pressure to develop and capture other agronomic benefits. Certain cover crops or cover crop mixes will help build nitrogen and soil organic matter as, um, as well as year round biological activity. So as Bryce mentioned earlier, uh, oats scavenge nitrogen in the top two inches of the soil, which uh, alone can hold back weeds, but they also can be tilled in with your primary tillage uh, at a later date and then used as a green manure, releasing that nitrogen that they scavenged back uh, over the time or over the growing season. Allopathic species such as cereal rye will create a toxin in the soil that hinders the germination of the weeds. Um, there are many advantages to cover crops, but we recommend starting with some of the ones on the screen but in the end, you have to decide, as Bryce mentioned, what you're trying to accomplish and the time of year you're trying to accomplish that before you start deciding what cover crops to use. And I just don't recommend throwing a cover crop out there because the salesman told you to use the cover crop. I think that you should spend time uh, growing different cover crops and trying them out based off of what you are trying to accomplish, not what the uh, seed salesman is trying to accomplish. And I'll, Bryce, I'll add you want to add? Yeah. Yep. So cover crops, uh, I, I can't stress them, uh, uh, enough how little we know about them. Uh, from which ones to use at what point in time to how we do, how they affect the soil to, to weed control. Uh, when we talk about cover crops, we're talking about what we see visually in, in the field. And, and so the important principles when we use cover crops on our farm is we have, a, we have a reason to use them and we set up year, a year or two ahead to utilize them in, in different ways. So whether it's, it's rye planted for no-till corn or no-till soybeans, uh, we're, we're making sure that gets planted in September by planting our crop rotation around it. Uh, if we're doing a diverse cover crop mix, we're not going to put it in in October 15th and get 
spend $50 an acre to get little benefit out of it. Uh, and, and so it's going as far into the science, why and how all these work. Uh, we, we can't do that tonight, nor do we, we have all the answers uh, why that works, but diversity planning and planning far ahead in the crop uh, in the cover crop world, and then understanding the, the effects that are gonna happen two to three years out. If you're using rye in your rotation, there's a good chance you're not planting wheat in the next couple of years because of volunteer rye. Uh, if you have a big diverse cover crop mix out there, you better be planning how you're going to take that down without having to do five to 10 tillage passes. And I'm being a little facetious there, but we run into people in the spring and wet springs that, that get caught with that. Or uh, we have a customers, we have customers that uh, planted cover crops, didn't get them killed with tillage. They came up in their, in their cash crops and they didn't manage them correctly. So again, it comes down to using cover crops uh, for a specific reason, planning ahead and then planning into the future, how you're going to terminate and control those are the, the three keys to being successful at them right now. So principle number three is one that we hear a lot in organics, and it's been a big buzzword the past few years is the soil health. Our first line of defense in weed management is soil health. Uh, healthy soils support healthy crops, which minimize opportunities for weeds. So balancing soil pH while improving soil biology through diverse rotations and increasing the tilt to allow aeration with, will control the weeds as well. Um, making key nutrients uh, bioavailable and building nitrogen through plant fixation should also decrease the weed pressure. So ultimately soil health will decrease weed pressure, reduce fertility expenses, minimize disease and pests and optimize management efforts. Uh, the other thing I'd mention here too is that you need to listen to your weeds. Uh, some prefer acidic or basic soils. Keeping your pH balanced will prevent those weeds from becoming an issue. But it also lets you know if all of a sudden you start to see those, then maybe there's something um, out of balance with your with your soil. And similar to conventional, we can uh, control our pH by applying naturally mined agline or gypsum. Bryce, did you want to jump in with anything either? Yeah, I can. I, and I can bring it back to our farm in Manning, Iowa. Uh, one of the big telltale signs and there's three of them one is uh, the soil test balancing the soil test out with calcium potassium and magnesium is one of the big uh, indicators of soil health having those balanced number two we look at uh, weed control uh, for one example of this is alfalfa after our, our three years of alfalfa we can go into organic corn and we have a two-week window uh, that uh, the, the alfalfa provides that aeration, it provides that balance, that natural biodiversity balance in the soil. It does, it does something in the soil and I can't explain 100% of it, but we have an extra week, week and a half. Uh, if we get a rain right after we plant and I don't get in there for a week to do weed control, I'm still going to be pretty okay after that alfalfa crop. So that's that's the, the second way we judge it. And the third way we, we look at it is that is that how the crop is, is progressing through the year? Is it having issues or is it uptaking uh, nutrients? And uh, is it green in the tissue test showing us this? And this isn't all solved overnight. Uh, it's headed in the correct direction uh, by having a well, uh, a, a high calcium soil with adequate sulfur and then adequate P and K. Uh, and then looking in the micronutrients is really in the back of my mind right now. I'm not saying it's not a good thing. It's just, uh, it, it's just, uh, um, not something that we're focusing on our farm, uh, but then that, that uh, diverse crop rotation comes back to the ultimate factor of soil health. Thanks, Bryce. <clears throat> I'd also mention that, that with on our farm, we had the same issue. Uh, when we took it over, it had been 10 years uh, before it really had any good fertilization. And so one of the things that we noticed is that we also had uh, some other weed pressures in the end rows and most of that was due to compaction and after some deep tillage we were able to reduce uh, that some of that weed pressure on the end rows and once we started getting fertilizer put back on there with all the micronutrients that come in natural fertilizers uh, we started to see yields climb back up so as we move to the fourth principle 
we'll talk about is uh, the tillage tools or, or your tillage toolbox. So tillage tools are our primary defense mechanism. So here are a few key tips. Uh, prior to planting, it is important that we get the soil bed as level as possible. Possible so early forms of tillage can have good soil contact to eliminate germinating weeds. As mentioned earlier, plan on performing some of those tillages passes every three to five days from planting to canopy. If you see weeds, you need to change your plans. Uh, being proactive, preventative, and aggressive is key. Uh, consider increasing planting populations to compensate for the extra tillage passes. Uh, this isn't like the conventional farming where if you see the weed, it's time to go out there and spray. If you see the weed, uh, chances are the tillage tool you're practicing or planning on using is not going to be useful at that point. Um, mechanical weed management tools are improving each year and remain reasonably priced. However, you must assess if you have both the tools and capacity to get the right or to get the job done. Bryce, did you want to? Add yeah, I can, yeah, I can bring it back to, to our farm in Manning and we've gone through the whole whole uh, whole chain of events that I, I think a lot of organic farmers go through. We've, we bought almost every piece of equipment and we sold almost every piece of equipment except uh, three rotary hoe or a rotary hoe, a tine weeder, and a cultivator. Uh, with good management, good practice, good rotation, good fertility, good management again. Uh, it, it, a tillage or a toolbox can involve those three, I believe. Now, there's some instances, you know, where a flame weeder and a, a rod weeder makes sense, but having those. Uh, um, three things we've been very effective and then it goes down to understanding how to utilize when to utilize those how aggressive to utilize those machines uh, really just it takes experience and it takes learning uh, and the biggest the biggest thing I, I could tell people right or tonight that I've learned is you can never be too aggressive in, in almost every situation uh, be aggressive uh, having being aggressive and, and taking care of the weeds rather than uh, not being aggressive and leaving a few more corn plants has, has hurt us more than it's helped us uh, during the year. Jump to the next one, Steve. All right, so for the fifth uh, principle that we'll talk about, organic price premiums provide the opportunity for great profit. So let the return on investment drive your weed management decisions. So delayed planting based on weather may take a little off the, the top off the yield, but it ensures capacity and on-time execution. So one example for this is on our farm, um, we planted a little bit early, oh, soil temperatures where we thought they were gonna be, um, and another member in our group planted at that same time. Well, it turns out that our stand wasn't as good as we thought it was gonna be, so we tore it out and replanted whereas another member waited another week, who's in that same latitude as us. He had a perfect stand, good yield. Um, the other member that planted the same time as I did, they didn't And so they had a, a, a little less of a stand than we did, but the one who had the best weed control was the one that waited to plant. And he also had the less money invested because he didn't have as many tillage passes trying to control what was already done. And uh, paying for that extra seed to replant. So we need to evaluate the um, expense for walkers for soybeans versus having a multiple year issue. Is it worth the extra 70 to $150 an acre for walkers if it allows uh, me to have a better weed control that season and prevent expanding the, the weed seed bank? If I don't use walkers, how will that impact me next year or further out from that the following year beyond that? Spending a few extra dollars um, to have the right equipment will add value to your weed control plan as well. So like Bryce mentioned, he got rid of certain tillage tools because they just didn't need them on their farm. Um, and we're kind of like that with Bryce. We're a smaller farm and we have a rotary hoe and a cultivator and those are our two most heavily used pieces of equipment that we use on our farm. Bryce, did you want to add into this? Yeah, yeah, I can. We can talk from a, a data standpoint and and from a, our farming standpoint. Uh, you know, I'm 
three years in a row we've we've made the and I've seen multiple farmers do it in across the across the states this year. Uh, going for that big yield, we we it was perfect planting condition condition in April 27th. Uh, we planted all of our organic corn, and the cold snap came. The weeds and the corn came up at the same time, and we ended up replanting everything May 28th. Uh, and we're starting to gather yield data and information and understand uh, the. the the planting dates on organic corn year over year, pushing them back into that May 15th and May 30th range has resulted in the highest yields from the data that we're understanding and receiving and, and utilizing. And so we're, next year when, when it's April 25th and it's you know 80 degrees out and uh, uh, the planter sitting there ready to go, being able to, to look at that data is go hopefully going to help us make that decision again. And so understanding that data backs up these decisions, even when it's so hard, everybody else is, is going around the neighborhood, uh, being able to, and, and or planting the conventional corn to, to be able to back off. And then as, as Ken talked about, evaluating expenses in a long-term rotation it is going to help you understand how to make the correct decisions and, and get the correct equipment and whether to spend uh, certain amounts of dollars in one year to benefit the next four years. So uh, uh, that's what I have to add, Ken, and Steve, we can move on to the next one. So with that, one of the things before we jump into the weed control tools, I think one of the things we've learned along with our members is that you, know, you can focus on any one of these principles and you'll see some benefits. Um, but it's only until you, you really have all five of these principles working together in kind of an iterative process and stacking on top of each other that you're going to really achieve the kind of weed control that you want. Uh, and that doesn't mean that you're not going to have any fields where you're going to have issues, but uh, over the long term, it is that journey where you know, your practices and collecting the data and forming your decisions in the future, your execution is going to get better, your plan is going to get better. As you're doing that, your soil health will continue to improve. And all of these things will, you know, all of the five principles can start working in collaboration with each other. And oftentimes we'll see, uh, you know, when you're starting out, it's hard to get them all right at the same time. But those, those groups that really, or those farms that really accelerate at weed management or organics, again, you know, have figured out a way to find that balance between the five principles so that they have the best potential outcome. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Bryce to just talk through uh, some weed control tools that uh, uh, you, you can use and what are the right situations uh, to, to deploy them. Yeah, thank you, Steve. And thanks for wrapping it up. I think that was a a good wrap up and we, we just want to be clear and honest up front on all of our farms. We still have mistakes. We still have uh, issues uh, and weeds in our field at some point, but uh, you know, getting better every year uh, it, it is one of the things that uh, we, we have seen and uh, it, it makes it a lot easier to farm organic and a lot more enjoyable uh, when you know when you, you can monitor or you can uh, put down what you've done wrong and get better every year. So. If you want to go to the actually, next one, Steve. Actually, I'm going to jump in. We have a few questions that came up. One is, uh, do you plant corn first or soy? Many of the guys in our areas have gone with soy first. So that's a very good question. And one that I have been uh, wrangling with all, all the last two months here, going into the next three months before we decide what we're going to do. Uh, the, the things that come to factor for me is, if I plant soybeans uh, after alfalfa, I'm going to take that alfalfa out after the fourth cutting, uh, September 15th, and, and hopefully closer, maybe missing a, a fourth cutting, maybe missing a fifth cutting where we're at. Uh, so that's going to cost me a potential 200 to $250, $300 an acre uh, on alfalfa tonnage to plant my rye because I'm going to do no-till soybeans where I'm at. Uh, not saying everybody does that, but and then I'm going to miss a, a spring cutting of alfalfa I would take before my organic corn was planted. And so I'm talking about, I, I'm looking at a $500 an acre swing 
uh, and alfalfa tons that I'm giving up to plant soybeans after alfalfa. And I have to weigh that in a long-term rotation versus doing corn, uh, potentially using a little less nitrogen. So I, I'm building out these rotations, putting in all the data that we, we have, uh, and then doing corn and then doing no-till soybeans, but having the chance of planting rye late because the corn doesn't finish, or my cost of drying goes up, uh, and, and then move into a small grain back into alfalfa. So right now I'm leaning towards uh, doing, doing soybeans right after alfalfa, giving up to $500 an acre, because my level of confidence is a lot higher to do successful no-till soybeans uh, right after alfalfa than it is to do it after organic corn. And then doing organic corn and then doing a peas or small grain uh, back into alfalfa. So. It, it, it's really a numbers game, to be honest, for, for our farming operation of a numbers game versus confidence level. Yeah, and I would say, too, that I think it, it just depends where you're at in the process. So if you're in transition and you're coming out in your first year of organic uh, crops, is that is soybeans going to help make up for that loss that you might have had through transition? Or um, how does that affect your rotation afterward? Because th does that mean that, you know, is it going to be three years before you have an organic corn crop? And, and how does that cash flow? So going back to that return on investment, does it make sense to do that? And then what kind of controls will you have? So following alfalfa, you know, it makes a little bit more sense, but you got to look at the bigger picture of how it impacts your overall rotation. Thanks, guys. I, I, I think that's really well said that it can depend on on the specific situation. And, and like many things in organics, there's not a standard rule that you can apply. You really have to look at the specifics of the situation. And from there, the data you have about what's gone on in the field, what your experience has been, and what your results have been to make an informed decision on how to go forward in terms of not only that next year, but also the long-term rotation and what's going to work there. Another question we received was, uh, have you, have we experienced or seen any issues with penny crest, penny crest pressure uh, in winter wheat and any tips on how to prevent? Uh, we've had some issues with penny crest being a major problem in the last two years. <laughs> and just being honest and open here, I have not dealt with it uh, very much, but the process I would use to, to understand you know, how to deal with it is why, why is the penny crest showing up? And, and so I'd start my research is, is penny crest like soil imbalances, uh, such as low calcium, high sulfur, uh, those type of things, and, and start addressing the soil first, uh, and then look at rotations. Is, does penny crest, when does it come in? When does when is its growing season? When does it reseed? All those type of things and develop a plan around it. So that's what I, I would do is sit down with you and learn everything about it. I just haven't dealt with it much. And it might be because of where we're at in our rotation uh, that uh, um, it, the, the only easy way I know how to get rid of it is alfalfa or uh, going into three years of alfalfa. And that's the, the, the easy button for us. But Solving it without that would take research in, in that soil health uh, and nutrient balance and rotation. Thank you, Bryce. All right, uh, let's keep moving along. So Bryce, we'll hop into the rotary hoe. See, there's one more in there. Oh, one more question. To... Oh, sorry. Uh, it, what's the best way to fight cockleburr? Yeah, the best way that I know of right now, and it's not the only way, is to bury it as deep as possible. Uh, that the seed seems not to come through uh, deep tillage. Uh, again, I can go back three years of alfalfa will take care of a lot of weeds. Um, there's only one weed that I, a grower has told me about that alfalfa eventually won't choke out. Uh, and that's the, I forget the, the name of the weed, the one that came from the south that uh, has creeped up into our area. But bur bury it deep or uh, uh, three years of alfalfa. And then start, again, it goes back to those principles. Uh, start with that soil balance. Balancing a soil can, 
can prevent a lot of problems. It won't prevent 100% of cockleburr, but it might slow them down. It might change their growth patterns and things like that. So uh, we haven't seen much of it just we, with our three years of alfalfa. I've seen it in fields. It, it, it happens a lot. Uh, burying it is one way that I've seen works in a decent matter uh, uh, for, for growers. Okay, thank you for the questions, everyone. Uh, keep them coming. Bryce? Yep, so Steve, if you wanna go to the next one. So on our farm, we've talked about the rotary hoe as a key preventive tillage tool. It might be what I believe is one of the most important uh, uh, tillage tools on our farm. Uh, we, in learning how to use it, when to utilize it and how aggressive to utilize it has been uh, very, very helpful to us. One of the major things it does is it, it loosens up that soil. It prevents that early weed growth, slows it down, uh, taking out the white hair weeds. Anytime that we can get a good rotary hoe in the summer that's hot, <coughs> early after weeds are dying in the next hour, uh, we know we have a good start. That corn can get up ahead of the new weeds. Uh, and, and so understanding how to utilize this and when to utilize it and how aggressive to utilize it has been very important to our success in buying rotary hoes, ensuring that you have a free flowing wheels and that your, your spoons are adequate. If you go out, out there with uh, bad bearings and inadequate uh, spoons on this rotary hoe, you have about $1,100 bar going across the field. Each one of those spoons is about 50 bucks and we're replacing them every about a thousand acres. Uh, we're aggressive on replacing them, but uh, it, we feel it's that important. So ensuring the rotary hoe is, is adequately working is very, uh, very important. And speed and being aggressive. You can't be too aggressive with the rotary hoe in most situations. Uh, I've seen many, many more times people have been uh, not aggressive enough and have not done the, the correct job. So don't be afraid to be aggressive. Uh, alternate directions every time you rotary hoe through the field, it just helps uh, move that soil more. Um, and, and expect some, some destruction in your crop. If you're taking, if you have 34,000 and you're taking out a thousand plants an acre, it's okay. You're doing, you're doing a pretty good job uh, of getting the weeds. Um, and then there's a, there's a time you have to stop and move to cultivation, but that rotary hoe is one of the key aspects of, of being successful. Steve, I see a question. In there about the rotary hoe. Do you want to read it or do you want me to? Yeah, I, I can I can read it. Will you rotary hoe in wet conditions? Does it cause compaction if the soil is too wet? Yes, we won't rotary hoe in wet conditions. Uh, you're just doing recreational tillage at that point. Uh, it, you're not going to do anything good. And we don't rotary hoe into a rain uh, for the most part, unless it's dire necessary. Again, that's just recreational tillage and I don't need any more time or my dad doesn't need any more time driving a tractor in this organic management system. So those are times that we, it, it just, it, it's over. It's, there's no use of running across that field at those points. So this is another piece of equipment that we utilize on the farm. Uh, it removes the non-visible weeds and it can be more aggressive than uh, a rotary hoe. It offers a bit more of flexibility. But I will say one of the big mistakes we've made when buying a time meter is thinking it will re replace a rotary hoe. Uh, that is not the case. We use a time meter a day after we plant to two days after we plant. And then we'll rotary hoe until that crop is aggressive enough to, or uh, tall enough uh, to aggressively start tine weeding. Uh, that, that emergence to about two, three inches out of the ground, that tine weeder will pull out corn and will we'll mess with, uh, with your stand enough that we don't run it. Uh, some people probably maybe could have if they want to run it slow enough and not aggressive. We feel the rotary hoe is much more important during that time. Uh, so big mistake we made is thought the tine weeder could replace the rotary hoe. Uh, but it is a good tool. It allows us to be more aggressive after that corn is up and tall enough to withstand it, uh, to, to be able to come in there and, and hopefully get to that cultivation pass that we don't have to move two and a half miles an hour when the corn's little. It does, it is effective at loosening the soil. If on this rotary hoe, I recommend, or pine weeder, I recommend 
Uh, you see the cylinders in the back on, on every one of those five foot pieces. Uh, that allows you to change the pitch of the tines from the cab as you're going across the field. Uh, pretty expensive to put on the tine weeder for, for uh, uh, what the tine weeder costs, but I highly recommend it. It's going to allow you to do a better job that you don't have to get out and manually, manually change them. But we can stick that tine weeder two inches or an inch and a half into the ground if we want. And, and so a lot more aggressive than the rotary hoe, but different utilization than the rotary hoe. Uh, in row cultivators, this is one of the, the, the things everybody thinks about. Uh, we own quite a few cultivators, uh, different ones from Buffalo to John Deere, Five Shank to uh, Ridging cultivators, like an Orthman. And so one of the things to understand when buying a cultivator and using cultivators, what type of soil do you have? Do you have sand? Do you have soil you can ridge up or is it going to be blocky and uh, and, and Till uh, and come up in chunks. That's how you're going to understand how to buy a cultivator that's most effective for your ground. Um, and, and understand how to achieve the highest speed and the biggest possible footprint. We are on 12 and six row cultivators where we're at for the hills that we farm in and, and the terraces we farm around. Uh, getting up to 16, 24 row cultivators is possible in areas. Understanding when to use side shields uh, early on. Uh, some people don't use them at all and they just go slower because they feel like those side shields leave that three, three inches uh, in the row that uh, uh, allows weeds to grow. Um, and so understanding what cultivator to use for the type of soil you have, uh, when to utilize it and how to utilize it by throwing dirt is, is a real art. And so those are a few things that we bring up when we talk to customers and purchasing cultivators. And I, I, Steve, is there anything else you want to touch on there? I, I went over in general generalization. No, I, I just opened it up to any questions that folks might have about uh, in row cultivators. We did have one uh, question. Um, it's rotary hoes are pretty standardized. You know, tine weeder brands can vary by design. Uh, you know, have you? Do you have a preference, or what have you seen from tine weeders? um in in the marketplace yeah and so i've only owned one tine weeder to to be fair with my assessments uh you've, i get these names messed up i think it's an einbach tine weeder that's the one you see in the picture there uh i, I i've gone along well with it uh is it an einbach i, I believe it is the, the the names are similar but it's, uh, it's that Beckler. color it's that one hot and beckler Beckler. Right. Hudson -Beckler. Uh, all right, that's the, the one I own. It's a German uh, name. It's close. Yeah. To <laughs> and, and I mean, it's worked very well for us. Uh, it is built in Europe. There are some pieces that we've completely replaced to uh, that were built a little bit cheaply, not expensive pieces, just uh, different pieces of iron on it that we have. So I can't say it's been perfect, but it's worked fairly well for us. The, the technology on it, the, the hydraulics have worked well. Uh, so I, I mean, I, I prefer that one, but I haven't used a whole bunch of them and a lot of our customers use those. So, uh, that, that's the, the take I would have on it. It's not a very good scientific or data-based one, but it's a personal opinion from use. Then we got another question coming in on a cultivator. What cultivator do you find works best in silt loam soil? Yeah, so that's what we farm uh, where we're at is a silt loam soil. So we use a, a Vibershank cultivator on our first pass to, to get that soil loosened up, uh, to get a little bit closer to the row and not have a, a wide sweep that takes out a lot of corn if there's a, a mishap. Uh, so we use that to start off with, and then we'll come back with a buffalo cultivator after that to throw a lot of dirt uh, um, on there. We farm some ground up north that we'll use. A, it's pretty flat and straight that we'll use. A, uh, it's a lot more loamy. We'll use a buffalo cultivator each time, each pass on that one. So, uh, 
Uh, weed burner and flamer. We owned a, a 12 row one of these. We sold it, uh, not because it didn't work, uh, just because we felt that the crop rotation and what we were doing, uh, we didn't need it anymore. And so we, we sold it, but these are effective tools if used correctly. Uh, they're, they're not that cheap to run, uh, not that cheap to purchase, uh, but effective tools in, in the right situation, the right planning. Uh, we've broadcasted whole stands uh, that have got ahead of us. So we plant corn uh, or we had planted corn early on and we have weeds come flame the whole field. It, it pretty much restarts the field. The corn regrows because of the growing points under the ground. Uh, we've banded it in corn and soybeans to target weeds uh, similar to the herbicide. And the real issue with this is you have to have really, really good timing. If those weeds get over uh, three inches tall, it seems like the, the effectiveness goes down considerably and the cost goes up considerably to running this. And just the speed of running it has slowed us down. And so that's where we've decided to go to that three years of alfalfa uh, to replace all these tools. Not saying everybody has to do it, it's a good tool, uh, but timing is so critical and uh, uh, operational use, how you use it and getting it right is very critical to being anywhere successful at this tool. So just one of, that's the, the main takeaway from weed burner flamers. And, and is, I'm not sure if we'll get this question, but we might still answer it here. Uh, which weed flamers to buy? And this is how I answer it to, to people. If you have employees and you're not the one running it and uh, say all the safety matters in the world, uh, the AFI is the one of the better ones that are, one of the, is the best ones we found with all the, the widgets and tools on it and safety. Uh, protocols. If you're if you're running one and you're the, the person doing it, understand how to run it and all the safety protocols, uh, you can build them from scratch much cheaper. Uh, they don't have all the tools; they're not as easy to run. Uh, the the I I, it, I think you could go either way, but that's how I would evaluate buying a, a weed flame. And the other thing I would add in is that we've heard from AFI that. Uh, Due to COVID, the supply chain is uh, you know, experiencing some disruptions. So if you're interested in going out and purchasing an AFI weed flamer for this coming year to uh, get, get out in front of that um, or contact them sooner rather than later. Um, and if anybody has any questions about how to get in contact with them, feel free to, to reach out to us after this. We can provide an introduction to you. Or for you, Bryce. Yep. Uh, one of the things that uh, we've learned quite a bit about at AgriSecure is uh, how uh, walkers. We call them walkers. Uh, we labor all that type of stuff, and it's uh, it's you know it's it's management too, uh, from the hiring process, hire process to having them on your farm. Uh, one of the things that we recommend is before starting, uh, review the expectations prior to starting. Be ready to negotiate a fee per acre. And this is actually becoming less and less uh, occurrence as more organic farms are showing up with more demand for uh, organic weeding labor. Uh, they, it, it seems like they can name their price and they should, it's hard work uh, and they do a very good job. Uh, but negotiation has become a lot less in, in the last year. Uh, prior to starting review, the daily start times and break schedule paid or unpaid, just understand uh, what you're what you're paying for, and what you're not paying for. A good good practice is to ask for references, uh, depending on if you've worked with them or not before. Um, but doing all that, being proactive ahead of time, can solve a lot of the issues that could arise from hiring uh, walkers. And so, one of the management things is to hire early if you're if you expect you're going to need them. As time slots fill up, uh, they, they're going to take care of the customers they've had before. Uh, so. And also getting to the small size weeds is a lot easier than removing giant stocks. So hiring early, being prepared, uh, being present during the process to inspect the fields so you know what you're getting for what you're paying. Uh, thinking you're going to have people out there walking your field uh, for the first time and you have one picture, they have another picture. You can catch that early, you can solve that. Um, break up into large, break up large groups. It's something that we've learned. Seven to, ten, seven to 10 help to ensure better progress. 
uh, flag fields for special requirements will help them to understand what they're supposed to do. Uh, and then cultiv cultivate aggressively after walking if you can. Uh, it's going to bury those weeds. It's going to get a lot of them that they missed or chopped off that re re regrow. Uh, one of the things that I, I can relate from learning this year is there's not enough people to do the walking. Uh, and, and high schoolers, I haven't found a high school crew to do it. So don't plan on that. That's one of the things I laugh when, uh, when producers I work with saying they're going to hire high school kids to do this. Uh, I haven't seen a crew finish a field yet nor finish half a field. Uh, and this is going to be limited. So if this is part of your plan to hire walkers to keep things clean, it, it's going to take a lot of planning and management up front. It's not a, a phone call uh, the, a week before you want it. All right. So that's going to, one thing I would uh, offer up at this point is that uh, on AgroSecure, we do have a YouTube channel that you can go and visit. If you go to YouTube and search AgroSecure, we should show up to the top. Uh, we have a variety of different videos. Some of them are related to different equipment with advice and, and video of what you're looking at, uh, including rotary hose and a uh, number of other implements. So if you want to continue to learn or see what we have to offer again, go to YouTube and search for AgroSecure. Um, Bryce, we did have one question. Um, oh, we had a couple of questions come in. So before we get into no-till, one is guidance systems for cultivators. Do you use GPS and guidance when cultivating? Yes, and so I'll touch on it now, Steve, and I know we have a slide coming up on it. Uh, there's there's oh, two that, types that, of guidance well, that's, systems that's that right. I'm aware we can of. Wait. Uh, we, can, we can wait for it. We'll, we'll cover that later, sorry. Uh, the other one is yep. what advice? What advice do we have for eliminating foxtail? Yes, so foxtail is one that's uh, very well aware of, and 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 uh, we've had issues with it. Uh, so foxtail loves hard, compacted, low calcium soils. This is one of the big ones that uh, uh, we we effectively can can control it in some sort of manner, depending on how bad it is, by uh, applying calcium at, at high levels because foxtail thrives in low calcium tight soils. Calcium is the biggest molecule uh, of, of the, the of the elements that we apply to the field. So when it's applied, it opens up that soil. It allows air and oxygen water through it. Foxtail thrives in hard soils from tillage, low calcium, a lot of driving on it, uh, which occurs in a lot of organic fields. So I, I think one of the things is to start with uh, um, uh, the soil test. I've seen huge, huge changes with uh, fixing soil. Second thing is the rotation. Foxtail goes to seed in corn and soybeans. Uh, two years out of corn and soybeans in some sort of rotation where foxtail doesn't get to seed. And that means harvesting something, not allowing it to come back for 30 to 50 days and putting on a new seed head and replanting because we didn't do anything with the field to control it. Uh, I've seen that happen where it, it can go to a seed pr pretty quickly uh, it is rotation in there. So those are my two answers, rotation, uh, balancing the soil with high calcium, usually foxtails and low calcium soils. Thank you, Bryce. Now we're going we're gonna to move into a discussion on organic no-till. This is another topic that um, seems to be uh, front and center in a lot of people's minds. Is organic no-till possible? Um, uh, and if it is, what kind of what can you do to make it work? And so we wanted to share a little bit of our perspective. We're not going to go real deep on it, but would appreciate any questions from those uh, online. Uh, that they have about organic no-till, or if somebody's had some experience where they've been extremely successful, it's certainly love to hear from you. So, Bryce? Yeah, yeah, this is a, a, an interesting topic. And I can tell you before we went organic, we were about 15 years no-till. So understand no-till, understand the principles, understand why people do it. Uh, and from my perspective and AgriSecure, the rest of our team's perspective, uh, it's important and it is an exciting opportunity for innovation and research, not only for the social aspect uh, and the environmental aspect, but for the bottom line. Uh, one of the biggest costs is 
we control and equipment and, and management and time and labor uh, to, to control weeds. So as a group, we're very excited about it. We, we, we think there's opportunity. Um, one of the things that I've learned traveling across the country uh, working with growers is a full no-till system right now is kind of that organic unicorn. Um, I'm not saying people aren't successful at it. Uh, we can document a lot of major failures uh, in a complete no-till system currently. Uh, but, you know, you got to try things to, to get to a certain point. Um, so what we had advised clients to do on this uh, is to minimize tillage first. Long-term crop, crop rotations that require less tillage. Uh, with what we're doing, we're tilling every two to as two, two to three times out of every six years uh, in our rotation and reducing soil disturbance as much as possible. Uh, so one of the things that we're test trialing this year is a biological that breaks down corn, or corn stalks so we don't have to go in and fall till. We don't have to do this huge aggressive tillage in the spring to bury them. Uh, we maybe do a light tillage and plant our small grain. Uh, so things like that that have a purpose and, and incorporating cover crops into the rotation and consider, considering the, the alternative cropping systems are reduced tillage, but that, that complete no-till, uh, I just haven't seen it work yet. I'm not saying that uh, it hasn't anywhere. I, I just haven't seen it. Uh, and I've seen a lot more every time disaster versus uh, uh, success uh, with a, a complete no-till. And so we, we say how we want to be careful here because we want to support it. But we want people to understand that doing it on 40 acres is okay. Uh, if you farm 500, try the complete no-till system on 40 acres. Don't bet the farm on it. And, and experiment there to scale it up to your larger acres. It, and it's, it's one of those things that we, we support. We don't want to put down, but we want to be uh, um, realistic with everybody that we're talking to and bring the the whole truth and, and understanding to them. And, and we want to learn and understand what's going on in your complete no-till system. But uh, we'll go through the next the next few slides. Well, things that uh, we have learned as a team and at AgriScare and the data that we have brought in, uh, what has worked. So some of the things that, that I really, really uh, have high hopes for is uh, soybeans and rolled rye. Uh, we have guys doing it all over the country successfully and, and they have failures, don't get me wrong, but uh, I, I would say we're at a 50 to 60% success rate. And the, the thing that we're trying to do is learning why success has happened and why failures happen to understand how we can have the Put, put producers that work with us in the best possible opportunity to succeed. Uh, you know, some of the things that we've learned, and here's a, a farmer in Emden, Illinois, that does about 500 acres a year of no-till no soybeans, transition and, and organic. Uh, he averaged around 40 bushels this year. Uh, conventional yields around him were 80, 85 bushels. A uh, really, really good part of Illinois. But it wasn't a failure. Had some fields do 55, some fields do 31 bushels. Uh, so big learnings that we take away is that it is time planning management made the entire difference. If you're planting rye October 1 to be no-till rye into soybeans, uh, every day after that just uh, significantly decreases the chance of success. And I, I probably personally wouldn't attempt it after October 1st. Uh, it, I think what we've learned, I've learned and seen is the, the, the success rate is just not where we want it to be for our farming operation. Uh, planning it September 1st, I would say we're in that 90, 95% success rate of having no-till soybeans. Uh, and then understanding that, that field of, do I have low spots? What am I going to do with the drowned out spots if it drowns out in the spring? Uh, Understanding that year one of organic is year different than year five of organic, if depending on your rotation, that one weed turns to 10, 10 weeds turn to a thousand, thousand turn to a million, and a million turn to a hundred million in uh, five years, it varies the success rate of, of organic fields as well. So taking all those factors in and understanding how they're going to impact you 
uh, is really going to drive success in this no-till operation. Here's some of the pictures. So what he has done is he's planted his, uh, he had his rye in after, uh, this field is actually, I believe after uh, wheat. So he has a good stand of it. He planted his soybeans. Uh, I believe he planted early, actually he planted them in April. Uh, and it says October there, but I know this, we have that wrong. Is This one was September. Uh, planted soybeans April 22nd and then rolled the rye May 19th. And this field did very well. I believe it was around that 50 bushels a, an acre. So he set himself up for success in this field. Uh, I, I know another field he got planted in October. And that was around 30 bushels an acre and a lot more weeds in it. Uh, and so those are the factors, again, just reiterating them. It, it, just because we plant rye doesn't mean we can do no-till and be successful at it on an average if we're looking statistically. There's got to be preparation. There's got to be understanding when to when to not attempt it, uh, when to attempt it. And, and some of the agronomic things I like to talk about too, just jumping back a little bit, uh, getting that rye in early gets to the head of the weeds, it, it, not only in the fall, but it's going to have that jump start in the spring. So it's sucking nitrogen before those weeds and it's putting out a allelopathic effect before those weeds even get started. So it, it, it's got that bigger jump uh, and then earlier rolling, earlier planting soybeans, all those just factor into that, that success. And Bryce, one question. So just to, to clarify here, so he plants into the rye and then rolls it after he's planted the soybeans, but some others will roll it and then plant. Uh, is that correct? And you know, do you have a, uh, do you have any insights on where you know, one approach versus the other might work better? And to be honest, I don't have enough experience, data, or information to, to make that uh, assessment or judgment from, from my personal opinion right now. And, and I haven't made it on our farm either. Uh, it, there's a third option in there. Leave the rye standing and combine it and then harvest the beans later. Is that is that the better way? Uh, you know, from planting and then rolling a month later, Planting, planting and rolling uh, that that May nineteenth. I, I don't have enough information or experience or, or data to to be able to confidently say that. So we had a question about this. You know, uh, the question was roller crimped or or just rolled. Uh, roller crimped. Everything I talk about is roller crimped. Uh, I haven't had much experience with people just rolling it uh, with, a, with a smooth roller. Uh, the ones I had, it hadn't worked for them. Uh, and, and so I haven't heard, heard of it for a very, I haven't heard for a while people just uh, using a roller on it. Uh, I, I think from my understanding that that just simply doesn't work. You need that chevron pattern to, to crimp and kill it. Thank you. So here's the May 16th, what his rye looked like right before he rolled it. And he rolled it on a, a diagonal pattern. So there's not much here, Steve. I think we've, we've hit it all. Um, here's okay. what it looked after he rolled it. Uh, not 100% kill, but uh, I planted at 200,000. Final stand 130 to 150,000. Oh, go back one, Steve. I did, sorry. Oh, all right. Uh, so high planting populations is also important. You're not going to get the, the stand that you normally get. 130, 150,000 I'm comfortable with. Uh, after seeing, seeing it go through a couple of years, uh, that gives you full yield potential. Uh, we does, we does, we control has been, I would say, from, from effective to very effective when he gets that rye in early enough. Uh, but uh, stands can be spotty with, with the soybeans. That's one of the issues. Uh, that that he has come come up with. So I think bigger issue is when you plant and then roll it. Uh, the, the the rye competes with the soybeans early on, uh, so that would be one of the issues that we've ran into. And when you roll it and plant it at the same time, uh, we've seen a little bit better stands because you're not having those two compete as they're coming up. Next one, Steve. 
I did it. It just must be a little bit of a lag. Yep. So one of the one of the things why we 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 feel important to people that we work with and, and the the, uh, the community is why do we do stuff and to understand why we're doing stuff uh, either as a social impact, environmental impact, or economic impact. So we are able to capture that economic impact into soybeans and to plant, uh, plant it into rye. Uh, as you can see here, our total cost is about $483. And I, I believe we have a misprint there, Steve, uh, $126 on planting is probably high uh, for that, but we have it in the other one too. So I just want to throw, pour that off before we got that question. So uh, what, we, what we have here is about uh, a 40, $40 difference uh, on our cost of production. Uh, over 500 acres, that's $20,000 for, for the guy that we work with. So not, it's not the all ends be all, but understanding why you're doing something, understanding the impact of your farm is, is one of the important parts of it. Yeah, so here's the system where with uh, the soybeans planted into rolled rye, you can one, have a very effective weed management system where you can reduce the tillage in that field for the year and expend less and less dollars uh, in part because you have fewer activities going on. Those, the reduction in the activities, all the timing in the rise of the rye soybean field is extremely important, but it also creates a little bit of capacity where he can spend a little bit more time focusing on his organic corn and making sure that he gets the most out of that corn. So there's a lot of synergies uh, in the system where you're not bringing in additional cost. Uh, now, what, what you need to figure out is, you know, can you get that system figured out to the point where you're getting the yields you would get in a traditional sort of organic approach to soybeans? So you still have that revenue. You're able to manage the, the production risk and bring along these other benefits. And that's something where at Agris here, as Bryce mentioned before, what we're looking, what we work with our members to do is really say, look, let's let's start off with something new on a smaller set of acres. Let's understand how it's going to work on your farm, or if it's going to work on your farm, and then from there we can scale it up and figure out how do we take those successes and build them into that long-term rotation. And if we skip all the way back to the beginning of this section, look from a no-till perspective, we hope that someday we can get to a true full no-till system that can be used uh, more broadly and on, a, on operations that have larger scale, uh, larger scale acres. Um, but until then, you know, what we're looking at is, one, making sure that financial sustainability is absolutely critical to your operation because without that, we can't pursue all of the other benefits, um, both environmental, soil health, uh, and, and other aspirations that we can have. And so we're saying let's get there in a stepwise approach and let's start by making sure that we're trying to reduce tillage, look for option or oper op and, and not reduce tillage just in one year, but over your field plan, I mean your field rotation, or your crop rotation, and opportunities like this uh, planting rye, uh, planting soybeans into rye are a great opportunity to take a lot of that tillage out of one year. The other thing that Bryce has had some experience with and has been experimenting with is intercropping, another option to help reduce tillage and bring some other benefits uh, into that, uh, to the farm. Um, Even, so uh, we do, go, uh, go ahead, Bryce, no sorry. Way. No, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, there, there's a good, a good point that uh, one of the, uh, the people that are listening made is, uh, when, when considering a rolled rye in your rotation, uh, you're eliminating small, uh, a lot of food grade small grains after this, because uh, this rye will put out some seed no matter how good you roll it. Uh, whether you all look dead, somehow rye sticks around and puts seed on uh, in nearly every, every situation. And so understand the impact of rolling rye too affects you the next one, two, three years of doing any food grade small grains. Uh, just an important part that the one of our listeners brought up that uh, is very important. Thank you, Michael. So, 
Bryce, before we jump into the next section, the final section, we did get a question. It's not necessarily related to weed management, but it's about fungicides and what fungicides uh, we've seen be effective or are utilized in your operation or our members' operations. Yes, and so it's a good question. Uh, I, I think starting with the, the fungicide question is we utilize it if there's a need to utilize it. We don't fungicide everything. Uh, on our operation. It's a scouting and, and fungicide uh, if it's needed. And the three fungicides that we've used in the past have been Prosidic, uh, Regalia, and Pyganic, which is a, is a pesticide. Those are the three that we utilize at AgriSecure and understand. Um, you know, their effectiveness is, is I would say, it wavers. Uh, I, I think there, if there's a need to use it, I think it's worth it, but just doing blanket coverages uh, because corn seven, nine, eight, ten dollars, we hear that a lot. Uh, I don't think that's a, a effective. And I'm looking a lot, to be honest with you, at our farm, a lot more of the natural fungicides uh, that cost maybe a dollar, two dollars an acre, the neem oils, uh, those type of things that you can buy in large quantities, which most of these fungicides are already made up of, uh, and, and tr test trialing just uh, straight natural products. Don't have any any history on that. So it's just, uh, we're at the early stages of understanding how those work. Uh, but that's our take. That's my take from, from my farming operation. Steve, there's one in the Q and A too. Uh, yes. So uh, we have a couple of spiny pigweed in our organic pastures and in corn. When we rotate to corn every four years, spiny pigweed does not show up until mid to late June. Cows will not eat it. Any suggestions? Yeah, and, and I actually saw that question a, a while ago, so I did some reading uh, while Steve was talking, just to, to be honest with everybody. Uh, the, <laughs> the, 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 the things that I, I mean, I point out, uh, soil test again, it starts with that, understanding what's the balance of your soil. But uh, some of the key parts that I picked out uh, were overgrazing uh, is a major major pinpoint uh, to get this weed started in your in your pastures. And so it, again, I'm not an expert at this. This is things that I've pulled up and read quickly. Overgrazing is one. Uh, and then burying the seed before you go to corn. Uh, just looking at the research online here, uh, it, they see 50 plus percent germination rate if it's laying on top and less than 7% germination rate if it's, if it's buried uh, at any level. And so those are two things I would, I, I mean, just reading that I've, I've done in the last 10 minutes here, uh, not, not graze the, the pasture as much until you get rid of the, the weed uh, or add in uh, a species to choke it out and, and not have to, to graze it so much. Uh, then before, go to, before going to corn, uh, do a little bit heavier tillage and you might be doing all that already. I don't know, but that's the best answer I could come up with right now. Thanks, Bryce. Now the, the final section uh, we'll cover and then we can open it up to questions afterwards. So feel free to stick around is, you know, ag tech for organics. And so Bryce is gonna talk about, you know, some of the things that are in the market now, what experience we've had in terms of effectiveness with these, and then also touch upon some of the things that we see potentially coming down the pipeline that could play an important role in weed management. Bryce? Yep, perfect. So, Steve, if you want to start with the next slide. So, this is going back to the question of uh, optimal guidance. Uh, we have had people trial quite a few systems in our network. Uh, I I do not use any on our farm, um, not yet, at least. I think they're they're very valuable. Uh, I'm waiting because uh, you got to balance the the cost of all the of doing everything and choose uh, what you're going to do. But uh, I think. This could play a very important role on the farm. And so the two things that, that uh, exist out there are the old style cultivating guidance systems with the little wands and uh, go out the back of the cultivator. And those are fairly effective. Uh, what we've I've seen is people having issues keeping ones running. They buy old ones that don't have parts for them and then getting parts for them. So understanding that. One of our other co-founders runs this optimal guidance uh, camera system and he runs it on uh, 16 row cultivators and hills uh, and 
has very is very good things to say say about it and its effectiveness. They do, I believe, run twenty five to forty thousand dollars, so they're not cheap. But uh, I, I can say it does improve accuracy and precision. It allows uh, an operator to be less uh, less experienced, and but it still requires skill. Uh, and applications for uh, are for hill hill ground uh, where you have terraces and stuff that you're going around that it really helps for. But this is something I would really consider on our farm and, and push people to do more research and understand and see if it's it's valuable on their farm. And as most technologies, hopefully, you know, the cost of the guidance systems, the effectiveness will increase and potentially the cost could go down over time as well. Uh, one of the other things that we've seen uh, is a weed zapper. Uh, we have clients using this as well. Uh, they, they've uh, really emerged uh, or really uh, brought their technology to the forefront over the last couple of years. And uh, I think it's a good tool for specific situations. Uh, they've made good improvements in the last three years. Uh, you know, one of the, the tools to uh, weed issues for next year. So if you have soybeans with foxtail or pigweed or whatever it may be, this is a tool to not allow them to go to seed. Uh, one of the things that uh, I noticed is this is not a speed demon uh, and you're going to have to use it multiple times a year. And if you're using this, you, you have other issues you need to solve, uh, but can be a very valuable tool for, for certain situations. And just understanding how many acres you're going to need to get done each, each day, understanding that you're going to do it multiple times per year. It's only going to get the weeds above the canopy in a week. Uh, it, it, this, this weed zapper confused me because I had customers that just loved it. They were gonna buy two or three of them. And uh, they said they ran it and I went and visited them uh, a week or two later. And I was like, hey, we, I didn't believe them they ran it in the field because a new set of weeds had already coming up through the canopy again that uh, it didn't even look like they had ran it. So you gotta be prepared to, to run it a couple of times at two to three miles an hour. Uh, high horsepower tractors, the cost is not cheap. Uh, the, the, the speed is not quick, but uh, very effective tools in certain situations. But as we go back to the beginning, there's no silver bullet. Uh, some things that uh, we've, we've had members test trial uh, and actually we'll probably utilize next year in, in some sort of fashion uh, is these autonomous type of tractors and controls. Uh, and and we're, we, we are heavily engaged in looking into them. Uh, one of our co-founders had a, a field taken care of by autonomous, as you see on the left there. They're not big tractors and tools, but they can run 24 hours a day. Uh, I can tell you we don't, I mean, we don't have every answer in the world on these, but uh, I, I think there's something people need to be aware of because they're a real game changer. Uh, maybe not this year, maybe not in the next three years, but uh, in the future. Uh, we know labor is hard to find on farms, and we know that uh, uh, one thing we can be sure of, nothing stays the same. So we are, we are investing time into understanding this, working with groups, uh, understanding what 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 value what cost uh, what this could bring to an organic uh, cropping operation? Steve, I know you've done more uh, more in that than than what we have what I have. So if you want to add anything, yeah, what I'd say is that um, you know autonomy and robotics uh, is receiving a lot of investment within the agricultural space and more broadly, but. Um, you know, there's certainly some opportunities and needs within agriculture that uh, there's, there's, there's just a significant amount of investment going into finding ways to leverage it to help provide solutions to clear challenges. Right now, there aren't any leaders um, that have um, systems that are going to be ready for large scale acres next year. Uh, however, if I think if we shut our minds to it, it's going to be, um, we'll be late adopters um, and potentially miss an opportunity. Uh, so it's a space to watch out for. And I know that a lot of the robotics companies uh, and autonomy companies are looking at a few spaces um, for those early adoptions. One of them is you know, high, high, 
high value crops, so fruit and vegetable crops, where the expenditure per acre is fairly high, um, and there's a lot of labor that goes into every field. Uh, but another one is organics, where um, you know there is more field activity and a smaller set of tools. Uh, and so AgriSecure is in discussions with a number of different companies just to understand where they're at and hoping to help them trial their systems uh, so that they can learn and get better and, and, and meet that point where both the cost and the accuracy or the effectiveness of the tools makes it a, a real option for our members. And so it's an area to stay tuned in and, and maybe at the end of the next crop year we might have a few examples of real-world uh, field results to share with with everybody on the call. So with that, um, I wanted to wrap up with two thoughts. One, you know, we talked a lot throughout this about having systems uh, and uh, and well, having a system to capture your data, to understand what's worked, what's not worked, to help you execute. And one of the things that AgriSecure has developed for organic farms and exclusively for organic farms is our MyFarm platform. And really what we've done is we've built it around the model you see here is we focus on the planning up front, make sure that we can help execute and then track everything that's happening in the field. That allows you to report for your certification, but then even more important or just as important is being able to analyze what's happened that last year so you can get better uh, for the next crop year. Um, and so it's one of the things that if anybody's interested in finding an opportunity to talk to somebody from AgriSecure about our MyFarm platform and how we, part, we, we couple that with an advisor, uh, please reach out to us. We'd be happy to have a conversation and give you a demo of the platform. Um, and then, as I mentioned, you know, we're really here to help farms succeed. Uh, we love doing these webinars, but we'd love to also build a deeper relationship with those of you who may get value from it. So feel free to reach out to us. Uh, we'd love to have a conversation and see if we can be any help and also answer any additional questions you have. So with that, we are going to move to Q&A. We have a few questions in the queue. This is an opportunity for those on the phone to continue to ask questions. Um, let's see, one of the questions we have here, this is a doozy. I don't know if that will have an answer to it, but let's see, Bryce. Uh, quick question about uh, using alleopathy. I don't even know if I said that right. Uh, sorghum has an alleochemical, sorgo, oh, sorgo leon, whatever. Uh, what are your thoughts about using sorghum uh, or that chemical as a, as a herbicide, as a based herbicides as an HPPD inhibitor, is it approved for organic production? Bryce or Ken, do either of you guys have any thoughts? Yeah, so, so Steve, uh, break it down here into the, the two questions. Uh, you know, for the first question, using a, a little chemical, uh, I just, I, I'm not sure on, uh, I haven't seen the, the sorghum based one. I mean, they're, they're out there, uh, I've seen different different effectiveness out of them. I haven't used the particular one you're talking about um, on a small scale to trial it, not even on organic ground. And that goes into the next question. Is it approved for organic? <laughs> it depends which certifier you use. Um, it seems like everybody's saying it's approved. Uh, what we're being told is not in every situation. Uh, there's, there's a certain situation it is approved. So what we're working on with our group of growers and the certifiers that we use uh, to understand where they're approving them, what's approved, and and why they're approving them or why they're not. And so it's really a case by case basis right now on this 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 type of herbicide that you're talking about. And I think there's weed slayer and suppress, and those might be a little bit different than what you're talking about with the the, the sorghum. Uh, and I can't even say the the name that that you have there, but. Uh, Again, I haven't, I haven't uh, used the one that you're talking about, and is it approved for organic production? Uh, the simple answer is no, it's not. Uh, and the, the complicated answer is, is the case-by-case -case basis that we, we're working through right now to understand how people can use it, what the certifiers are allowing, and, and what is approved, and what is right, too, for organic production. I think that's a, an important point. So, um, 
uh, regarding uh, insecticides and fungicides or any kind of crop protection products that are approved for organic production. So, and then we do have a question about, you know, um, somebody being unaware that there are uh, products that are approved for crop protection products that are approved for organic. So first, yes, there are products that are approved for organic production, uh, and, and there many of them are OMRI certified, which is an uh, organization that uh, provides approvals for um, a variety of different products across the supply chain um, to be used or to be sold uh, as organic. <clears throat> and the the key there is that uh, for those products, they're naturally occurring products, um, so they're not synthetic <clears throat> in nature. Excuse me, um, and that they go through an approval process that the production of them uh, meets the standards uh, for the National Organic Program. Um, but the other part of that is that each of them has a label and a labeled use uh, that they're approved for, and so. Just having a product that's approved for organic doesn't mean that you can use it in any way, shape, or form that you want to. It means that you can use that product based upon uh, the labeling and what it's been approved or how it's been approved to be used. So there are some things that you can use in a spot basis, but you're not able to use in a, a full field basis. Getting to the other question um, on fungicides and insecticides, uh, again, Bryce, do you just want to quickly touch upon the, the products that we use uh, uh, for fungicides and, and uh, pestic insecticides uh, in, an organic, yeah. in organic production systems? Yeah, Steve, I can jump into that. So, yes, there, there's fungicides, there's insecticides, there's seed treatments. Pretty much anything that you do in conventional ag, there's a form of organic for it that's approved for organic besides liquid nitrogen, a type of anhydrous those type of things. Uh, I mean, you can get uh, organic potassium, you can get organic sulfur, organic uh, uh, lime, and things like that. So just wanted to make that clear. But the fungicides uh, that we use are prosidic uh, for my small grains, and it also works on row crops too. Uh, but utilize uh, regalia uh, is for corn and soybeans on our farm. Um, I know there's multiple more ones out there. Uh, that uh, could be effective. We just haven't trialed them yet. So Regalia prosidic are the fungicides, the insecticides that uh, um, we've worked with is neem oil, uh, Pyganic is another large, another one. And I know there's more out there. Um, uh, there's multiple of the fungicides and insecticides. So I don't wanna make it seem like there's only a few of them. And then there's a follow-up question to that. <clears throat> Are there any insecticides for leaf hoppers and other insects in alfalfa that you've seen good results with? So I, I used Pyganic this year and I was not happy uh, for the cost of it on uh, our alfalfa for leaf hoppers and in, in that early year, early part of the year. Uh, and I started looking at some all natural, and I say all natural, just some different ways to do it. Uh, and, and heard a podcast and and uh, going to try a few things this year. One is Epsom salt. Uh, people, have, it's magnesium sulfate uh, is something that uh, is quite a few reviews from farmers that uh, cheap product that seems to work a lot of the time. I mean, you're talking about a couple bucks per acre, not $40 per acre. So that's something that we're gonna, going to trial this year. Uh, neem oil is another one uh, that... Uh, it has natural properties. It's in a lot of the products already that we use. Uh, if we just if we if we utilize it alone, will it work? Because you're still talking about a couple bucks an acre. So I've tried the expensive stuff. I'm not happy with it. Uh, at least last year, not saying year every year it doesn't work. Uh, but uh, those are the things that we're going to trial next year for the leaf hoppers and insecticides. And. Um... Another one we had is Weed Slayer. Uh, have we used it and is it effective? So I have seen people use it. I have not used it on my farm uh, on, a, on any scale other than a, like around bins for weeds and stuff like that. Uh, but I've seen people use it uh, and the effectiveness varies. If 
quite considerably from from what I've been told. Uh, one one side one and I've seen one it works perfect. The other guy it, it didn't even touch the alfalfa to weeds. And so depending on what you're trying to do with it, I don't have a clear understanding of how effective it is currently. We'll be doing a lot more test trials on conventional ground this year, uh, seeing the effectiveness of killing alfalfa both in the fall and spring uh, and, and doing a, a few burn downs again on conventional ground that uh, is not organic because we're not approved yet to use it as a full, full type of weed control. So it's still in the air about effectiveness of weed slayer. Um, I, I've heard good things. I've heard things that uh, hasn't worked so good, but uh, I think it's test trial it on a small amount of acres. Don't bet the farm on it and under, uh, understand on your own if it's going to work. And then as always, before you use something uh, on your organic farm, make sure that it's part of your organic system plan and that you've received approval from your certifier for the use in the manner that you're gonna use it. Uh, some of these newer products, uh, you wanna be really cautious uh, to make sure that um, you don't get yourself an out, of, out, of, uh, out of sync with your certifier. Um, regarding the question about uh, leaf hoppers, uh, Matt, thank you very much. Matt mentioned that Dan's All Star in Earlville, Iowa, has a good spray mix for organic hay. So uh, that might be something uh, that we'll look into certainly, but uh, uh, for whoever on the call is interested in that to look into as well. Uh, another I question came in, go ahead. Oh yeah, just to jump in and reiterate, as, as we don't have all the information, data and answers on these products. We're just giving you what we've seen. Uh, so. No, we don't want to put any products down or, or put them up too much because uh, we're still collecting data and information on them uh, to be able to understand exactly what they're doing or if they're effective or not. So just want to make sure everybody understands that. Yeah, that was not not an endorsement or yeah. uh, anything. <laughs> no, no. Nature, yep. or, put any, yep. or put anything down. So. Yep. Um, another one, another question was related to Blue N. So yep. uh, as and, and Bryce, you might want to give just a little bit of background on what Blue N is and if we've had any experience with it. Yeah, so Blue N is, is, is a very interesting product. Uh, it's been around in the U.S., I believe, two years now. I could be a year off on that. Uh, met with the, the people that brought it in from Europe. Uh, and, and I can tell you how I evaluated the product. It comes from a company out of Europe. I don't know the name of it off the top of my head, but... They're a well-established company. They only have a couple products. They've been around for many years now. So it's not a fly by the, the, uh, the night seat or fly by the seat of the company. Uh, they're not trying to sell every bug in a jug type of thing. Uh, they have a few products that have been tested and trialed uh, many, many years. And so that really got me interested in Blue In. Uh, we were supposed to trial it this year on our farm. Uh, it never happened, uh, and they never came out and did it. Uh, you know, for whatever reason, I don't, I, I didn't know until I had started to asking around if Blue In had, had showed any effect this year. And the answer, the answer I had received was uh, they didn't get approval for the U.S. organic side yet, so that's why we're not seeing very many organic test trials. Uh, but I think uh, the reputation of the company is good. The how they're going about it, it's very good. So I don't have any answer whether it's, it, it's uh, uh, I do have an answer that I don't think it's certified uh, as of the beginning of this growing season, it probably is now. Uh, I think it's a very interesting product. I think uh, it has potential. I think it's something to, to test trial. And that's another good point. There are a lot of products that are coming to market um, as biologicals or natural products uh, become more popular or more of an area of focus for both organic as well as conventional acres. Um, and so one of the things that we really focus in on is trying to narrow down those that have um, real science behind them, uh, can talk about the science behind why their products should work or why they believe they do work, and then um, you know, try to trial some of these products on a very limited basis um, in our regions and in the crops that we grow to make sure that there is truly efficacy there, efficacy there 
before even considering putting them on broader acres. Uh, and that's something that we recommend, you know, for any products you might consider. Um, let's see, there's another question from Ben. Uh, you mentioned that a three-year rotation corn, uh, corn, soybean, small grain can be problematic from weed control. Um, if you don't have livestock, what is another alternative to a longer-term uh, rotation? So Bryce, I think yeah. first, you know, can, can a, can a three-year rotation uh, incorporating a small grain be successful? It, yeah, so uh, uh, there's a lot to this question. I mean, a, a three-year rotation can be can be successful, but you're you're taking a lot of chances. A one-year mishap of of rain, you know, heavy rains, uh, weeds get out of control, they build up. Uh, you're going to struggle the next years, and so that risk of not having that uh, where we use alfalfa for three years to clean up any weed control issues that we may have had. Uh, you don't have that reset button. And so you're going to fight them year after year. And so not, is it possible to, to do a three-year rotation with corn, soybean, small grain? Yes, it is possible. People do it. Uh, is it the most profitable? Is it challenging? Does it have its uh, uh, extra cost to it? From what we see in the data, yes, yes, it does. So um, as far as can it be done, I, I want to be clear, yes, it can be. Uh, from what do I suggest looking at uh, um, if, if, uh, if you don't have animals, uh, depending on your location, look at, look at more small grains, build a rotation out and have, a, have a, an understanding of what you can make doing this. And is it the right place to do it, the right farms to do it? Uh, and what I always do, I start with the basics. So uh, looking at organic corn, and this is really basic. If you did organic corn one year, and just did a year fallow uh, of cover crops, building soil, build it, building uh, nitrogen into it, back to corn the next year, what, what's the probability look like? And then let's build in more complex rotations with things around you to, to get to a point where we feel it's sustainable. And if we can't get to that point, you, you, you might not be in the right area for organic. Um, depending on a lot of other factors, cost of nutrients, uh, where you are to uh, uh, markets. So all those variables play into effect of, of how I would build a rotation, how I would think about it. But we, do, we wanna do that before you jump into organic. So it's not five years down the road and we knew it wouldn't work before you started. Thank you, Bryce. Uh, another question came in. I've heard bury the, the weed seed deep several times. Does that mean use a mold bar plow? Mold bore plowed, sorry. Yes, I, I, and I'm not a proponent of the mold bore plow. I, I cringe when I say that, and that's why I kind of said it in a roundabout way. Uh, but the real only way to get some uh, rid of some weeds if you can't go to alfalfa is to bury them with the mold bore plow. Uh, you're not going to rip it deep enough to, to do it. It's, I, I want to be clear, it's not a proponent. Um, uh, of mold board plowing, but it's, it might be a necessary evil to stay in organic and, and to control some weeds, so. Perfect. Uh, another question. I'm newer to the organic farming game. I'm still unsure if growing organic, of, still unsure of growing organic soybeans due to not having the insecticide and the fungicide available and watching some of my neighbors' weed messes. Tell me, how can I make it work? Currently, I'm doing uh, two-year alfalfa followed by organic corn, then organic corn or small grains. Yeah, that's. I think I'm at the same point in my operation as well, uh, is how do you get comfortable with soybeans? Because I think uh, well, the information is showing us that they're going to be valuable going in the future because they're tough to raise. Uh, and more people are shying away from them. So figure out how to raise them, how to do it without having a mess and you know, having, having what your neighbors have uh, is important. So I think the, the way I look at it, uh, there's two ways. Uh, the no-till way to me, uh, I'm going to trial that, uh, taking out the alfalfa, doing soybeans first. Uh, just I, I, 
I think it's going to work. I don't have information or data that says it's going to work uh, in any kind of confidence level, but that's what I'm doing. If, if I wanted to be have a high confidence level of organic soybeans working, I would take one, maybe two cuttings of hay off, plant late soybeans, uh, depending on where you're at, uh, June 5th to the 10th, and build a budget for 30, 35 bushel soybeans. Uh, it just seems that June 10th, uh, uh, June, after June, June 1st, uh, the weed control confidence becomes much higher. Again, you're probably giving up a little bit of yield, maybe depending on the year. So building that budget to understand what you're giving up to, uh, to uh, minimizing that risk is important. Two cuttings of hay planting in June, uh, depending on where you are, will get you 30, 35 bushel beans with, with minimal weed pressure. Okay, any final questions? No, well, thank you, thank you everyone for uh, coming to this evening's webinar. We hope you found it informative and useful. As we touched upon, there is no silver bullet for organic weed management or rotations or many of the other uh, discussion items we had this evening. Uh, it really does take a systematic approach uh, and learning and improving every year. And again, we're here to help support you. So you can see the number on the screen and the email address on the screen. If you haven't been in touch with us already, feel free to reach out. Uh, we'd love to get to know more about your farm and, and your operation and see if we might be able to help you succeed at organic production. With that, I'm going to wrap it up. Thank you, everyone. Have a great evening and a wonderful end to a very challenging year. <laughs>